Hello. <laughs> I've been asked by a subscriber to make sure that I don't lose my northern roots. So, hello. Welcome back to Fish Locker out on boat. For everyone else, welcome back to the Fish Locker out on the boat. As you can see, it is a lovely morning just coming up behind me. We have got some porpoise. I've just headed out now and I thought I'd stop because you might be able to see me in the background. I've got a long steam today. Hopefully, fingers crossed, I'm going to be anchoring a wreck that I've never anchored before. Now, it's a long way and it's in deep water. I'm hoping that the conditions are going to be right when we get there. If not, it's going to be a long steam for not an awful lot of fishing. Um, we will figure it out as we go. I'm hoping that on the way there I might see some shoals of bait fish, mackerel, pilchards, scad, that type of thing, so I can feather up some fresh bait and then we'll deal with the rest when we get there. But this is just too beautiful a morning not to share. It's not hard to see why this is my favourite time of day, is it? Let's get going. Right, well I've got out to where I wanted to go. It was a long steam <laughs> and I have just going to run a couple of drifts over the wreck to start with just to see what the life of the wreck is like. If you want to, I will tag a video into here actually showing you how I anchor a wreck because the first thing I did was, because this, this is the first time I've anchored it, I steamed around and I mapped the wreck first just to see how big it was to see what shape it was that type of thing I think I've got a little fish on here now see what shape it was and see how big it was and then I'm going to run a drift over the top of it and I've just got a set of feathers on because I'm hoping to pick up whiting and pouting my search for mackerel was <laughs> well let's just say I don't have any mackerel and I'd literally just dropped down, I hadn't even had a chance to turn the camera on and uh, I think I've been smashed up by a link straight away it was like dush dush and then bit off so I think likely what's going to happen is when I bring this up now in a minute one of the feathers is going to be missing and it's going to have been a link that's bitten me off oh. there is, yeah, I think there's a lot of ling down here because that's another one there very violent bites what I might do now, actually now I know where we're going to sit, is I might swap over and I might put an actual wrecking rig on and have a drift over it with a wrecking rig. I have got a little bit of frozen cuttlefish, a frozen octopus. In fact actually I might put a slow jig on. Yeah we're not drifting very fast. Hoping for whiting and pouting because they're also fantastic baits. Those of you who've watched my wrecking videos before, this might seem like I'm repeating myself, but this is for people who haven't seen this before. I like to check what the life of the wreck is like. Because if there's no small fish down there, there won't be big fish down there. Because you need small fish for the big fish to eat. And also, it's a good idea to give them what they're eating. So if they're living off pouting and whiting down there, that's a good bait to use, because they're used to eating it. Yeah. We are in 292 feet of water. So it gives you some type of idea of the depth. Bring this up, we'll go around again. There, look. The bottom feather's been bitten off, and this one has had the tinsel bitten off it. You can see all the scratches in the line. That's Ling. That's Ling that's done that. Oh well. <laughs> at least I got my rig back. Yeah, well I know there's one fish down there at least. Right, I've rigged up a wrecking rig at the back, but while the tide is still slack, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try some of these new slow jigs that I've just got. I'm going to be fishing it just on a spinning reel. This is a, a Dio Ballistic 6000 and this is a, a Nomura IC popping rod. Now they're not designed for this but I like to test things out in as many different scenarios as possible just to see where they'll work and where they won't work. Now because we're fishing in nearly 300 feet of water I am using a 160 gram slow jig 
These are slightly heavier than I usually use. But we're fishing slightly deeper than I usually fish. So we'll give it a crack. What's the worst that can happen? Well, the worst can happen, I'll just lose it all. Oh, well it looks fancy, I'll give it that. Spin this boat around. It's the bane of my filming life, this. Always got the sun behind me, just can't help it. No matter which way I try and position the boat, it always spins back round again. Right. Let's give it a go. With this, I'm hoping for Pollock or Ling. <laughs> it's probably going to run out of braid, this. Just feathering it down, just in case something picks it up on the drop. Oh, sitting lovely on top of wreck now. Drifting at 0 0.4 knots. Like we're bang on slack water now. That's why I'm fishing on the drift. Just sitting on top of the wreck. There's no point me putting the anchor down now because I would just swing around. I need the tide to pick up and go in one direction. Then I'll know where I can lay my anchor. These slow jigs are deadly in shallow water. Not used them in this depth yet. Oh, there's a fish. There's a fish there. Yeah, I think it might be a pouting. Just a little fish. <laughs> a big fat pouting. Thought as much. But yeah, he wasn't coming off them hooks, was he? Them assist hooks are fantastic for hookups. And that is also a fantastic sign for the life of the wreck. Because if there's big pouting like that, and in fact, I don't know if you see on the side of him, look at that wound. Something bigger has had a go at him. So yeah, if there's pouting down there, there'll be Ling and Conga down there. I'm hoping to get down to the bottom quick enough because we're just drifting off the back of the wreck now. Ooh, missed it. No, I didn't. That feels like a better fish. That. <laughs> That's actually a PB. That is a coal fish. That round here for a coal fish is massive. Whoa. And again, there's something that keeps smashing them up, look. But. <laughs> I'm definitely going to get a photo of that. That is a fantastic coal fish. Oh yes! You don't often see me get this excited. <laughs> I might look, I might not look like I'm saying. Right, you can tell the difference between these and a Pollock. This one won't go back now, sadly he's blown. 
you can see because he's blowing blisters up in his sides here and I can see his swim bladder on the inside but you can tell the difference between a coal fish and a pollock because the coal fish as you can see is darker on the top when they get really big they go almost black but the lateral line that you can see here by one of my fingers is perfectly straight on a coal fish with a pollock it has a bump in it also the mouth here with a pollock it has a, a much bigger underbite Let's get some photos of him and getting, dis getting properly dispatched I've got that coal fish on the scale I don't know if you can tell I'm, I'm quite excited about that coal fish really didn't expect it to be a coal fish went on the scales £9.6 so almost a double figure coal fish that is fantastic and on the right gear as well but I caught that on the conga gear it wouldn't have wouldn't have been worth half as much would it 300 feet of water on light spinning gear on a slow jig perfect absolutely perfect couldn't have asked for more that's one of the things I love about fishing go fishing every single day and you think you, you think you've got like a oh, I, I think that'll be this fish or I think that'll be that fish or I'll fish here and I'll hopefully catch this every now and again a surprise turns up like that we'll see what they drift see what this drifts like with this slow jig if we have another fish we might carry on when we, we might carry on fishing with slow jig if not what I might do we'll go back and I'll have another drift and I'll use my wrecking rig instead Ideal baits are pouting or whiting that are about this big. Drifting over a different part of the wreck this time. Cool fish are often caught as you're winding in like this because they do like a, fast, a faster retrieve. So if you'd be pollocking a summit and the skipper will say, all right, everyone wind up. When you're winding up as fast as you can like this, this is sometimes when a, a coal fish will take it. You can, if you're going to be running long drifts, you can use a drogue. I'm only drifting over an area of 50 feet. The time it would take me to get the drogue out and then back in again or wrapped it around a fish. It's not really worth the effort. If you're running a long drift over a reef or something, a drogue can be really helpful. Often you can find when you're fishing with slow jigs like this is your first bounce is when you get the hook up. Oh. I'm keen, like the first 20 feet to get it up out of the wreck because all it would need to do was go under a little piece of structure and it would part me off Ah, Mr Pollock There you go, same jigs, caught a Pollock this time you can see the difference now see the difference now between the lateral line of a pollock and a coal fish see how the coal fish it's straight and white and the pollock it's got a bump in it there you go perfect <laughs> one took on the drop just feeding line out and I just saw the line start to increase in speed 
just enough time to turn the camera on. See what I mean when I was saying uh, earlier on when I was feathering the bait out, feathering, feathering the lure out? This is why. If I'd have just left the bail arm off and I hadn't been paying attention, that fish could have picked it up and just kept on running or it could have picked it up and then spat it back out or picked it up and gone in the wreck and I wouldn't have realised. So because I was feathering it out, I saw the, saw the line start increasing because the fish had picked it up. Not only did I have a chance to set the hook, I also turned the camera on. Now that is a proper sized pollock. Again, the sun's behind me. Right, now this is a proper sized pollock. Look at that. That is incredible. Three fish, three drifts, same jig. This one's got to be a double figure pollock. In fact, compare it to this one. Ah. Yeah. Might just go stockier than this one. There you go, look. There's the hooks. I don't do this type of fishing an awful lot because generally when you catch a fish from this depth, the fish is gone. You can't return them, unless it's an eel. What we'll do, I will have one more drop with this because I would like to try and get a ling with it. Because that would be three different species on the same jig. Let's get a photo of him. God, I tell you what, there's some fantastic meat on them, isn't there? See where they got all their power from, all these great big tail, that big tail and all these fins. And you see what I mean about the larger underbite that the cold fish doesn't have? Incredible. <laughs> if you were fishing with lures like soft plastics and things like that. Oh. As I was saying, if you were fishing with soft plastics over wrecks, you generally need a lot of tide. Because predator fish and the lures don't work properly if there's not any tide. These slow jigs, we're on a neap tide at the moment, which is the completely the wrong time when you want to be fishing with lures, and we're on slack water. So it just shows you how these slow jigs are absolutely perfect for turning a time when you shouldn't be able to catch fish like pollock or coalfish or bass. Slack water on a neap tide is not when you should be fishing with lures, historically. But these slow jigs work perfectly. There's a lot of tide today. I mean, usually there's like a, a three knot tide run. I wouldn't be able to get down there with this little tiny lure in this depth. It's about matching, matching your tactics to the conditions. Conditions today are small tides, slack water, not an awful lot of movement lends itself perfectly to slow jigs. One of the things I've found as well is when you're dropping them down to the bottom, don't just drop them straight in because they flutter like that. If you drop it in, drop it in for a second and then jig it, it straightens it out in the water and then when you drop it, it should drop straight. But it's the fluttering movement. It, it seems to trigger fish on, so it's the so sharp up slow down, sharp up, slow down, because you jig up and it flutters down. The dispatching of fish is a bit of a controversial subject. I use a method that's quite similar to the Ikjimi method, in that I have a sharpened spike and I brain them and bleed them. So you snip the gills, 
I'm not going to show you on camera because there's some people that don't like seeing that. But you snip the gills. If you Google it, there will be there will be videos on the Ikujimi method. But you uh, you bleed the fish, which is better for the meat, and you brain it. I don't agree with battering fish over the head because quite often it doesn't doesn't dispatch the fish, and you just end up battering all the meat. Drift's starting to pick up now, that's good. Anchoring in this depth of water, I don't want to have to do it too many times. I'd rather wait an extra 15, 20 minutes till the tide's properly flowing. We are in, let's say, 290 feet of water. So I'm going to be letting out 650, 600 to 650 feet of rope. So a lot of rope. Right. I have eventually <laughs> untangled my anchor rope. I don't know if you can see that boil there behind, but there's just been a tuna of about, estimate, 800 pound. Easily seven or eight foot long, about that round. Just jumped out of the water right behind me. <laughs> Hi, well, I'm actually, I'm 45 minutes behind when I wanted to put the anchor down because I've been that long untangling 600 feet of anchor rope. I have 20 feet of chain. I have, what is it? A five kilo plow anchor. And I'm gonna be using a boy and an alderney ring to haul my anchor. I definitely don't plan on pulling 600 feet of rope with an anchor attached. Right, circle up round, put the anchor down. <laughs> right, well I've managed to get the anchor down, but <laughs> I don't think I've got it right first time. I think I'm going to end up swinging off the wreck. I've got my bait down there on the bottom, but I don't think it's going to stay there. Oh, there's a bite. Yeah, I'm down there on the wreck now, but I've got a feeling we're going to swing off it. So I'm going to have to re-anchor. I would have been amazed if I'd got it right first time. Ideally what you want, depending on the strength of the tide, is you either want to be... You either want to be just off the wreck to draw the fish out of the wreck to your bait or sat just on it. If it's not a very snaggy wreck and there's not an awful lot of tide, you can get away with being sat right on top of it. Well I've re-anchored and I'm just waiting for the anchor to settle and I've just rigged up another slow jig, dropped it down. And someone's picked it up literally the second that it hit the bottom. And it's quite a quite a heavy fight, just like a, a nodder. Considering that this was supposed to be a, a wrecking at anchor session, I'm not doing too badly on this rod. Oh, another cracking pollock. another really solid fish look. Taking on a little silver slow jig this time. There you go. The start of this it felt massive. It just had a real heavy like swim back to the bottom. Took it on the drop I stopped it about 10 feet off the bottom and it just it was like nah, just was, zh, zh, all the way down. It is loads more, loads more sporting fishing light like this. We're just a light setup. 
rather than like the usual shutting setup. another colossal pollock typically the sun is right behind us I'm sorry I can't do anything about it but yeah that's another be close to double figure pollock that this slow jigs just nail it I don't know if I'll be able to show you it but there is a blue shark swimming past, just over there. Well, Perseverance has hopefully paid off. Fourth, maybe even fifth time of anchoring. Lost five sets of gear into that bit of net. Just finally tried anchoring up on a different part of the wreck. I think I've found my first conger eel. No, but it is a massive link. Right. Whoa. Taking on a running ledger rig. Whoa, that hook was well in there. I'll stop messing about. Get my gloves on. This ling has been hooked before. Apart from trying to bite me hand off. Give me that back. There look, octopus. This ling has been hooked before. You can see because, see the damage on the side of its mouth there? And it has a bit of damage on the other side as well. So he has had a hook in his mouth before and he's gotten off and that hook has like broken off. So someone snagged up into him, lost him and then the hook's come out. But his luck has run out. There you are, a cracking link. God, we've got some eating fish today. He might go 20, but yeah, this is all the rig was. It was just a sliding ledger rig, 10 ounces of lead. So that two and a half to three feet of 200 pound mono, ending in a 12-0 with some octopus on it. Now what I'm gonna do, that oh, thing's bit me thumb. It's bit me thumb through the glove. I'm not going to take my glove off because I know it's bleeding. <laughs> I've taken the fillet off of the side of a pouting. I've taken the fillet off the side of a pouting and I've cut it into strips. So I put them on as a strip bait. Just that little extra bit of flutter, like that in the tide. 
It's hopefully going to bring me the fish. Right. <laughs> I am not going to take my glove off because I know my thumb's bleeding. I'll sort all this out, then we'll get me sorted out. On this rod, I've got my wrecking rig. On that rod, I've got sliding ledger. What I wanted today was I just wanted to come and find out what this wreck was like. It's a big wreck, not an awful lot of people fish it. I was hoping that it might hold some big eels. That's my target species really, is eels. I'm happy to catch other fish as long as it can go back. I've, I've got a lot of fish here now. We're going to be... <laughs> Our house and my father-in-law is going to be eating fish for quite a while now. I don't really want to be catching any more ling. Ling are another fish that suffers badly with barotrauma. By the time they reach the surface, they're already dead. Whereas a conger eel could swim all the way to the surface and all the way back down again. I think I'll get a glove on. Yeah, they have got really, really sharp teeth, Lee. As you can see there, it bit me right through the glove. This is one of the things on a day like today when it's absolutely glorious. I end up getting preoccupied and I forget to drink any water. Then I get halfway through the day and wonder why I've got a headache. It took me ages to get this anchor set right. I'm sat, sat okay at the minute, touch wood. Just very light winds and very light tide and they just if they'd have been both together, it'd have been absolutely perfect. I would normally like to put these fish on a stringer. So I've got them over the side in the water so they're keeping cool. But with that shark around earlier on, I just thought, no, nah, there's no chance. Just tempting fate there. Something going on here. It's a heavy fish. Now that is a proper size conger reel. That'll be a 40 pound deal. Every day of the week. Just the sheer girth on it. Christ on a bike. When I say that's a big eel, that is a big eel. Get that rod up out the way. <laughs> Where's my glove? <laughs> right. Keep an eye on that rod for me.
hooks out. It's just the girth on this thing that makes it so big. Calm down. Right. <laughs> Look at the size of that. Oh, still, a, oh, there's still a foot of it on the deck. Whew. That is a big fish. Right. Let's get his seal back. I've weighed it as best as I can. It was 45 and still on the floor. So I'm going to call this a 45 to 50 pound fish and I'm not cheating anybody there. Right, there you go. Head first. Oh, no problem. Straight back. <laughs> Fantastic. That's what I love about conger eels. pair of dolphins just here and they've just chased a little group of fish to the surface feeding on them. I think it's a mother teaching a calf. Here they are here. See him? Yeah we've had everything today. Tuna, dolphins, sharks. I'm still made up with that monster coal fish. That was fantastic. As you can probably see, the wind has picked up. It's backed off. And it's picked up. So we're swinging about a little bit. Luckily, this is quite a big wreck. So we are still on it. But I think, I think we're going to have probably half an hour before the wind picks up that much. It overpowers the tide and we're not going to get a chance to fish anymore. Definitely can't complain. Definitely can't complain about what we've had already. What a fantastic day's fishing. I'm going to have one last try with this slow jig. Stopped fishing with it because I was catching too many fish with it. Yeah, I'd like to get one more reel out. An amazing day's fishing so far. I um, was fishing with a slow jig when the tide wasn't right to anchor and I was catching a little bit too many fish <laughs> I was catching too many fish so I tried to put the anchor down too soon which is why I, was, I had so much messing around if I'd have waited longer I wouldn't have been messing about as much tide is really pulling through here now. Thought this might happen. I hope that hasn't happened to them other ones as well. That piece of net that's on the wreck I anchored us up on a different part of the wreck to get away from the piece of net. And we've swung back towards where it is. That might be it, I might be snagged in it now with the slow jig. That'll be annoying. You can sometimes bounce them out. If it's just metal, or if it's just lightly hooked into something, you can sometimes bounce the snag out. This doesn't feel like it, this feels like it's solid. Ah, well, sort all this out. Right, I did lose that slow jig. It was stuck in a piece of, like either a piece of line or a piece of net or something, because as I was I put a glove on to pull it and it broke and I got like an extra 10 feet and then it comes, so, comes solid again. Um, lost, the show, lost the slow jig, but I got one of these stuck in it and I managed to get this back. So it must be that whatever's down there is old 
because the slow jig rod, the braid and the, the mono wasn't strong enough, but my conga gear was strong enough and it broke through it. Um, this is my standard conga gear, it's just an ugly stick, this is a 3050 and uh, a TLD 20. Now I've got, I think I've got 60 pound braid on there and I've got 100 pound rubbing leader. If you want to see the tackle that we use, we do review a lot of it on the Fish Locker Workshop channel. I will tag that channel into here now. The other rod that I was using today was the first outing of my new conga rod. Another ugly stick, but this one is uh, one of the old classic conga rods. Fantastic. It had uh, a cracking ling, first drop, and then it had a, a brute of a conga. Like I say, 45 to 50 pounds every day of the week. Couldn't weigh, couldn't weigh it properly because I couldn't lift it high enough and I, would, I didn't want to put too much pressure on it. If I'd had a, a big enough sack, I would have weighed it in a sack. But like I say, yeah, 45 to 50 pounds. The, uh, the slow jigs absolutely nailed it today. Perfect for the conditions. Slack water over a wreck. They were the, the Thor, the Thor pitch jigs. Thor slow pitch jigs. And one was in uh, cotton candy and one was in gold orange zebra. What a Pollock thinks gold orange zebra is, I have no idea, but I know that they catch fish. We had a... <laughs> I still can't get rid of that coalfish. That is, it's my personal best coalfish. Um, yeah, I'm made up. We had a great ling. Um, double figure ling, double figure Pollock. Nine... I can't remember what it was, was it? Nine, two, nine... I'll have a look in the video. Anyway, a nine pound coalfish and a massive conger. I can't help but feel that if we'd had mackerel, we would have had more fish out of this wreck. Just because they, they create more scent. But you can't have everything. We, uh, dolphins around us all day, tuna all day, and a blue shark. Like an aquarium out here. I am going to, I'll go about cutting all these fish. And then we will uh, look at pulling the anchor and we'll make our way back because it is starting to pick up a bit. I don't know if you can see the motion and the wind's changed. But yeah. I'm going to have to buy some more of these. That old cracking. Right, come on. Stop messing about. Let's see about getting that anchor up. <laughs> Felt like that was sixth time today. I did say to myself, I said, I'm going to try not to anchor up. <laughs> I'm going to try not to have to re-anchor so many times. Because it's really deep. Still ended up having to do it like six times. When you see it start to bury, that's when it's reached the anchor. like that. Now although that was tiring, 600 feet is a lot of rope, although that was tiring <laughs> it's nowhere near as hard as having to pull the whole thing by hand. I hope you've enjoyed joining me. I've had a cracking day, I had to work hard for them, them last few fish though. It's all part of the fun, all the best. Oh, if you like the videos give them a like. Give us a comment, let me know what you think. Subscribe to the channel and make sure that you select all notifications. That way you'll get a notification the next time we bring a video out. If you think that your friends might enjoy the videos or benefit from the hints and tips, share them on to them. All the best, we'll see you later.